My name is Lashana Williams. I am a massage therapist and a mother um, and a tender of people and places and things. In the context of today, um, one of the things and places that I tend is a death space. And a lot of folks will commonly know that as like as a death doula or not commonly know. Um, and so some people are like, what is that? What is that even? And so it's a little bit of explaining. My personal work is I tend to people who are dying. Sometimes I tend to them well in advance of their death. Other times it's not well in advance of their death. And it is short notice um, or it's an unexpected situation. I also care for a lot of people who are choosing medical aid in dying. Um, Some states call it death with dignity and also voluntary stopping and eating and drinking. And so throughout those processes or however we get to meet, I will do what they would like. Sometimes that's a relationship that is about paperwork or planning. Um, Other times it's a relationship of, can you come over and create some art with me? Because I am pretty anxious. Other times it's kind of figuring out doctor's appointments and advocating with hospice. It's really varied. My strong suits are the are the people tending and the space holding, space making. I am a wonderful advocate, but I'm like, I'm the one that comes in at the end. There's just, there's a Scorpio heavy about me that is just like, it's too much sometimes. So it's like, I'm the good person for the end of the advocacy when we really need to say the things. And then, and then I'm there. You know, we, we have to know our strong suits as, as caregivers and as doulas and know like what we're good at. And, and what we're not and, and really work to either grow those edges that, of things that we're not good at or be like, no, actually, that's someone else's that's someone else's bag like that is they are great at that and refer folks out. Some folks Google like what is a death doula, a doula near me? And then they'll call and be like, so a friend just told me that you exist. What, what do you do? Like, how do you help me die is a common question. And it's like, okay, that's, you know, that's like people think you help someone die. Well, that person's doing all that dying on their own. Like you get to, you get to accompany a walk with them, but helping them die is, I think that's part of capitalism, quite honestly. It creates a false sense of a need and the need for this work. Like this work has been done in community by people since we've been birthing and dying. There's no new need, no new discovery. It's a new line of income for some people. I mean, the practice comes from those who took care of communal birthers and dyers. And, and since we've been birthing, people have been helping us give birth. Since we've been dying, people have been doing something with the body. When people are sick, folks tend to them. These are practices that are that are not modern that are as old as us. And I think that that evolved as as we evolved, as our living situations changed, as our, you know, depending on where we were in the world, like we are in small communities. How our infrastructure is set up is is in some spots solely dependent on the humans that create our, our community. In the States, it's different because it's set up to benefit capitalism and and productivity, not necessarily people. So we're not necess- we're not living in smaller like communities and towns and villages. We're in cities. Or if we're if we're not in cities, we're pretty far apart. Medical care isn't close. We have the access to things changes depending on where you're at. Um, and care is one of them. In the in the ways that we live now, doula care has been provided by hospice nurses and care and neighbors and family members and friends, uh, clergy. And, you know, it's, it's been provided by a variety of folks. Um, and the like upswell of a, of a field of care of a death doula. Like I, I, I am so thankful for folks talking about the need for someone to have a non-medical person with them at the end of their life. A non-medical and and a non-familiar person, right? And not not someone that is not a member of their family. The space that they hold for questions. The dying person may have some questions that they not they don't may not want to ask someone that they're related to. There's there's something to be said for having having just a third party who you feel safe with, who you feel comfortable with, who is really looking out for you. In the vein of like when we're when we're caring for someone, what what types of consent are we looking for? 
are we talking about? Like personal consent, environmental consent, medical consent, consent for for movement. When when people are are dying, so many things happen to them that it becomes routine that things just happen to them. And so a lot of times like the asking is taken taken out of the routine. Is it okay if I lift you up while I change your sheets? Instead of, I'm just going to lift you up while I change your sheets. You know, like changing the word so that you're asking and waiting for an answer. Consent goes back to really, I think, um, empowering a person to remember that their yeses and their noes are still theirs. I think it, it, it varies as far as like the relationship that you've been able to grow with that person before they died. If you have had a relationship and have been able to talk about it, hopefully that's something that you're going to talk about. You know, I'm going to, if you can no longer verbalize, I'm going to look for these things for consent. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for you to squeeze my hand. I'm going to look for your fingers to move. Uh, I'm, you know, you, you share with each other the ways that you will communicate non-verbally looking for consent. And then if there's nothing, if there is no physical way of understanding consent um the thing that you can do is make sure you're talking to that person the whole time and letting them know you know i i know that we're not able to communicate right now and i hope that this is okay it was okay before um and i hope that it's still okay now and if it's not i'm sorry um i'm doing this because you know you needed you needed to be dried and i needed to rotate you um, you know, so really just explaining what you're doing and why you're doing it, if you can't get consent. A lot of the conversation is really just listening, witnessing people talk about what's going on, um, how they're doing it, uh, the words that they choose, just really, really listening to what they're saying in their body language, listening to what people in the room aren't saying, um, really just trying to, to take in what's going on. Um, and then working and taking like ridiculous, ridiculous little notes so that I try to remember all of these things um, so that when we're talking about a care plan, um, those things come into play. When we're in, in a situation where people are dying, um, whether it be a longer process or someone choosing medical aid and dying, so a very known process, that like energy is there. People are anxious and sad and maybe mad. People are already grieving. Um, there's just, there's a lot of feelings going on. And so being able to like sit with all of those people and still be steady is what I'm talking about. Still be able to be like a steady presence and also honor and recognize that the movement of that space is not for me to control. Like I am just in it and I can control me and make sure that I am steady for these humans. A death rattle is something that I talk about with people. We talk about like, as the body is like letting go, like it, it loses control of, of air and that's different ways. Um, and like as living people, we understand like the the intrinsic link to air and life. And for folks around watching someone um, and, and noticing their breath shift, their breathing pattern change, it becoming erratic, you know, no longer in, out, in, out, but it might be like in, in, out, in, 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 out. Um, just erratic. Um, folks around can become really anxious and nervous. And sometimes um, the death rattle is there and, and audibly it is uncomfortable because you know that 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 body is no longer able to clear the mucus that's present. You know that that the muscles are, are no longer working um, and that things are building up and that air is making its way through. But that person is, is closer to death than folks have typically known them to be. So that in and of itself can be unnerving. And so talking with folks just about how the breath will change, um, and we don't know how it will change, but please depend on it changing. Um, I feel like is an important preparatory conversation for anybody that's going to be present during a dying experience. We're on a planet that's moving really fast. People forget that like we are in motion and when like when we can we can go slow we have been sold a bill of sales um that says we have to go 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 
and um and we don't we don't i think our i think in that like that mentality spreads through our death right someone dies okay get them to the funeral home okay get them ready three days to do this and then often buried and done oh are you done grieving what stage are you at you're only there like <laughs> this whole what in the world you know you want me back at work uh i only get two days because it was my husband like ah you know like it's it's a very very um unhealthy structure i think i feel it in my heart when i grieve um and when i'm honoring someone i think i feel more of a, like a, a joyful rejoicing um i i say some really particular words with my gratitudes in the morning when i'm honoring someone i mean i have a special candle that lasts a few days for when I come home from a death and I like that. Um, and that is um that stays lit for a few days in honor of that person. Um my I, I have my own personal practices around them. Um but I think the grieving, I feel I feel it in my full body. Do you think there are benefits to it becoming professionalized? Yes, of course I think that there are some good things because I think what that would do is increase access, increase education, increase knowledge elevate conversations to people who who may not have seen the need for it before um and on the other hand what it creates is probably a certification system probably some schooling system that's also going to cost an absorbent amount of money um it creates a another gate then for people who have been doing this work uh to get through and in this country the systemic racism the systemic sexism all of all of the things that are put in place, make it so that that those gates are really typically accessed easier by certain folks. And community, like our doulas are, we're everybody. We are, we're, there are cis folks, queer folks, trans folks, like we are representing ourselves because we can, because we have access to this information and we care for each other. When you bring in a licensing system, someone is letting people in and someone is deciding who can get that license. What we would find is that in the United States, a lot of those schools are in English. So right off the bat, if English is not a language that you speak, you don't have access to these schools or that certification. And and all the the, the people that you're caring for, you you may not need English to care for these people. I think that having a shared set of values and ethics are really important. I think that having a shared scope of practice is very important. I think that teaching deaf care is, is, it's, I feel like it's a responsibility, but it's not, you know, like it's once you understand and know it, you can share it. Um, And I think it's important that folks do that. The more that we certify people for insurance, the more we play into that wheel. Insurance is then going to dictate who legitimizes that training. I literally took a training. Oh my gosh took a training for this man in the beginning of his book when he talked the the training manual when he talks about the history of doulas this white man said it started in 1988 with me and my hospice volunteering and this man owned like it, it is a very 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 successful doula company like it's one of the ones that people are so tied up with they can't even mention the 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 things that are uh, the things that need to shift in the training, the things that that were wrong, the things that were homophobic and racist. But those are the people that we would then be looking to for legitimization and and to make the standards for certification. Um, so I struggle because then the power goes right back into white man's hands. I feel like it's a dangerous place when people stop learning. I much prefer to be a human tender. Um, if I can just really focus on, on people, um, that's what I like. And I also understand that my strong skills are, are needed elsewhere sometimes. So it's a, it's a big mix for me. I, I feel best and I feel most in line with myself and my values when I'm doing right by that client and I'm doing something that I know how to do and not something that I don't know how to do a lot of times in death education schools, especially death doula schools, people will say, fake it till you make it. 
And I, it hurts me so deeply when I hear people say that, because it's like, we are not baking a cake. We are not baking a cake. We are not baking cookies. We are talking about people's lives. We are talking about the end of their lives. And like, we don't fake it at all. We, we show up authentically with our true skills and our values. And, and when we don't know how to do something, we let someone know because people are hurt when we fake it. Um, that's what causes the need for certifications. And all of that is when people are unauthentic with their skills for the sake of making a dollar or gaining a client. 